Hello, everyone. If you're joining us and logging on, we're going to wait a few moments before we begin just to make sure we uh, we see people in our in the room. But thank you for spending your, your evening with us. Hello again, everyone. If you're just logging on, we're just watching the, the participant count here. And when it, when things settle down, we will start our program. But again, thank you for spending part of your evening with us. Okay, I'm watching the, the number count. I think we're ready to begin our program. Thank you for spending part of your evening with us here at Fall College Planning Night here for Holy Names Academy. Um, I'm Megan Diefenbach. I'm one of the college counselors here at Holy Names Academy. And my colleague, Angelica Johnson, is operating the PowerPoint and will be uh, functioning behind the scenes tonight. But I typically work with last names A through K. And Angelica, if you'd like to say hi. Yes. Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Angelica Johnson, and I typically work with last names L through C. And tonight we're, we have an, a, a program that we're excited to present. But before we, we start in, and we know that people are still coming, uh, coming in tonight, so uh, we will be recording this. We see it's recording, so that looks good. And this will be available behind the parent portal, hopefully later this week by the weekend. But we're going to launch just a quick poll. We're curious who's out there. So if you could just let us know who is in our audience tonight. If you have multiple grade levels here at Holy Names, please let us know. Guest speakers, can you all see those results? Excellent, okay, good. All right, wonderful. All right, so it looks like we're kind of tied with our Class of 2024 and Class of 2025, the juniors and seniors. But thank you to our parents of, and family members of ninth graders, as well as our sophomores. This is great. Thank you for responding to that poll. Okay, get that down. Okay, so we have an agenda prepared tonight. And what we're going to do is, is Angelica and I are going to give you kind of a, a pulse of where we are with our seniors. Uh, we'll give some college counseling updates and just a little bit of overview about just the general application process. So tonight's program really is geared towards seniors and parents and family members of our seniors. But again, we welcome all grade levels tonight to learn about the process and to hear most importantly from our guest speakers. So we have three speakers joining us tonight on our college admission panel from various time zones out there. And you can see some of the topics that they will be addressing, some current trends in college admissions and looking through those trends um, through the lens of their particular universities. Of course, we'll talk a little bit about standardized testing, the parent's role in this process, how an application is reviewed, and we'll go over those different uh, application programs of early action, early decision, regular decision, and so on. And so our speakers tonight, as we move ahead in our PowerPoint, we are thrilled to welcome three, uh, three individuals who represent three different institutions and all three of our guest speakers tonight are, are the Holy Names Academy representatives for their institution. So we're thrilled to welcome them. Um, I will. Their faces are here. They're going to hop off the screen shortly, but we have Siobhan Coleman from College of the Holy Cross in Massachusetts. She's actually in Tennessee right now. Anna Richardson, Senior Assistant Direct, Director of Admissions from Oberlin College in Ohio. She is currently in Chicago. And then Ben Siegel, 
from right down the road at the University of Washington, but Ben is in Spokane. So we are thrilled to welcome everyone here tonight. Again, speakers, if you'd like to take your faces off for the moment, uh, we'll come back to you in a little bit. So Angelica and I will, will dive into our program to just, again, give kind of a state of where we are with our seniors and um, just give some general overview. Angelica, did you want to give some... Yeah, so I'll just thing. Yeah, thank pop you. in here real quick. So the Q&A is open. So, you know, as we kind of move through the program, feel very, very comfortable sending any questions in through the Q&A. Um, we might be answering them directly. We might save them towards the end for kind of a general Q&A. We want to kind of answer mm -hmm. them live. But again, any questions throughout tonight's program, direct them to the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Angelica. And I'm, I'm noticing our participant count is up uh, from when we started. If you're just joining us, we are recording this. We can see it's recording. That's always a good, a good feeling. So this will be available behind the parent portal for Holy Names, we hope by Friday. So if you miss something tonight or you know someone who isn't able to join us tonight, um, this recording should be available later. So we're gonna, we're, uh, Angelica is going to be operating the tech and I will be hosting tonight. So we'll dive into our next, move ahead here in our next slide. Before we begin though, we wanna remind you about another webinar that's coming up, our virtual college financial aid planning night. And so for, for in particular, for parents and family members of seniors, the financial aid process is unique this year. And our speaker is the director of financial aid at Carroll College in Montana. And she will be covering some of those changes that are coming, the timeline for the, the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, talking about the CSS profile. So that link was sent out in the parent newsletter. We will have another um, email sent out to parents and family members uh, in a few weeks. But the event itself is September 27th, again, 5.30 to 7, similar to this event. It will be a webinar and it will be recorded. So just a, something to save the date for. All right, we'll move ahead here. Okay, just some of the basics, just to give a quick overview for parents of seniors, hopefully as you're reading through what you see on the screen and what you hear me talking about, these so are hopefully uh, items that you're discussing uh, in your homes. Will your senior be applying to a college that offers all of these different options? That every college has a different way of handling their timelines and their processes. So we're just gonna go over this real quick. And for parents, family members of juniors, sophomores, and ninth graders, this might be new to you. So uh, welcome, and let's, we'll, we'll cover some of the, the basics here. So colleges and universities typically will have different deadlines and will have different application plan options. And so as you're reading on the screen there, we love acronyms in this profession. So ED or early decision is different from EA or early action. And then we can move on with these other little nuanced early action options. So if a college offers binding early decision, they might have one round or two rounds. The deadlines are typically November 1st or November 15th for early decision one. This is at the senior year. And then that early decision two might be in January, January 1st, January 5th, January 15th. The idea here is if a student and family have identified what the top college, this is where their, their student wants to be, the college offers early decision, and it makes sense financially, whether that's scholarship, that's need-based financial aid, family planning, and so on. If a student applies ED and is admitted, they typically find out in December, maybe early January, and if they are admitted, the expectation is they are attending that university, and they are withdrawing any open applications and are not submitting any additional applications. So that's that's a, a student can apply to one school under an ED plan. Early action is non-binding. That means a student could apply to an unlimited number of schools if it off if that college if the colleges offer early action. Again, timeline typically November first, November fifteenth might be December first of the senior year, and depending on the university, they might. A, a student might receive a decision two weeks after they apply or after that deadline, but it could be the college has a deadline of October 15th for early action, but they don't actually release decisions until January. It just depends on the university. That is non-binding. So a student applies early, receives a decision early, and with any of these decisions, 
most colleges will either admit a student in an early round, deny them in an early round, or defer them, move them to regular decision. And our speakers tonight will probably talk about what their colleges, how their colleges operate um, with these different options. Then we get into, again, some nuanced options, restrictive early action, single choice early action. This is a relatively small number of schools out there that follow these two uh, options. What this really means is if it's a restrictive early action is that a student may not apply broadly early action or early decision if they're applying under one of these restrictive options at a college. Again, a relatively small number of colleges have these limited early action options. And it's just a matter of this is all very well explained on college websites. So parents and family members of seniors, again, these are good, good conversation topics. And then for our uh, ninth, 10th, and 11th grade families out there, just as your as your children are receiving emails and physical mail, you will start to see this terminology and hopefully it'll make sense. And then the final two things here, rolling admission, priority admission. Some colleges are just really, they, they've streamlined the process. This, as soon as a student applies, maybe a week later, they receive a decision. It's not binding, it's just rolling admission. And the final option is regular decision. Some colleges, like uh, many public universities, for example, have just one application deadline. It might be November 15th, November 30th. Um, it, some private universities have just one application deadline which is of December 1st, perhaps, December 15th. If, if a college has either just one application deadline or has early and regular, regular decision is typically a student might wait to apply regular decision because they're not ready to apply binding ED to a school. So regular decision would make sense. And those deadlines typically are as late as early to mid January, sometimes February 1st. Okay, let's advance to the next slide. Thank you. Types of applications. So the common app, again, parents of seniors, uh, you're probably hearing your students talk about the common app. Um, Angelica and I hosted a, an application workshop back in spring when our current seniors were juniors, where we had them all get on their laptops, set up their Common App, set up a few other little things in SCORE, which we'll talk about here in a moment. And then in August, it rolled over, the application rolled over from a junior year application, kind of a pre-application to their actual application that is ready to be submitted for fall 2024. As you can see on the screen here, used by over a thousand colleges worldwide, and I see our slide here shows uh, a few examples, Syracuse, Villanova, University of Washington, Oberlin, College of the Holy Cross, and so on, all except uh, the common application. There might then be some institutional applications out there which are different from the common app. Many public university systems, in particular here on the West Coast, the University of California, the California State University System have their own separate applications. And then some individual universities have their own applications. And we put two examples up here, Georgetown University and MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, have their own application platforms that a student must use. So we are spending a lot of time with our seniors right now on the Common App and are hosting workshops and sitting and working with them hands-on as they're, as they're working to complete the Common App. Okay, let's move ahead to our next slide. And here in Washington, last year was the first year that every public university in the state of Washington joined the Common App. So prior to uh, the 2023 application year, 22-23 application year, uh, many of the public universities in Washington state had either their own individual applications or perhaps belong to a different platform starting with the class of 2023 and now moving forward with our class of 2024 and beyond. All public universities in the state and really all private universities as well use the common application. So right now that is our, our main focus with students. We'll start turning our attention to some of those other application platforms as we move through the fall. But here on September the 13th, we're spending a lot of time with our seniors, getting them set up uh, and using the common application. Okay, so just a, a, as I was saying earlier, here's a quick update on our seniors. So. Class of 2024, we are, Angelica and I are currently meeting before school, lunch, after school, sometimes a second virtual appointment after school. We don't pull students out of class to have individual meetings with 
Each senior and if family members can join us in person or through Teams virtually, we welcome parents and family members to join us. We held one virtual application workshop. It was recorded in Teams. It's available for seniors to view in their team. Uh, that was on August 22nd, the day before we started school. We are holding three virtual class meetings this year. We've already had one. We have another one this Friday, and then we'll have one later in the fall to cover financial aid. All of those are recorded. So they sit in homeroom, watch our meeting on uh, the smart board in the room, um, and then it is recorded. So if they miss it or want to go back and show it to family members, they can watch it later on. And all of this is housed in a team, Microsoft team, and it's the class of 2024 college counseling team. Feel free to ask your senior uh, to show you what's posted there, but that is where we tend to uh, localize um, a lot of the information that we're sending to seniors. This year, for the first time, we are working with SCORE. It is spelled S-C-O-I-R. It is pronounced SCORE. And this is, as it says there on the screen, this is an online college counseling tool that as juniors, the class of 2024, we encourage them to use SCORE to learn about colleges, to get organized, to start to learn about deadlines. Here in the senior year, it has two sides. This is how the students will set up um, where they're applying, what the timeline is for each of those applications. And that's how teachers and college counselors will be submitting the letters of recommendation that we are writing and will be submitting as well as transcripts. So all of that is happening through SCORE and is uh, working parallel with Common Application and any of those other individual platforms out there. And then we are also, during the school days, we don't pull students out of class to meet with them, but there are opportunities for juniors and seniors to attend in-person uh, college meetings. For the most part, some are virtual, but the majority are in-person college visits. So our three speakers tonight typically visit Seattle and will visit Holy Names Academy. So as of earlier today, we have 122 colleges from truly all over the world, not just even the United States, who will be coming in our building or uh, joining us virtually to meet with students. And typically the people who come in our building are the people who will read the applications of our students when they apply. Okay. And this is just a quick snapshot. If you've read through the parent newsletter or um, if you attended graduation last year, these are all statistics about our students who are uh, who graduated last May and some are already in college, uh, all set up because they are attending semester schools. And for those who will attend quarter-based institutions, including the University of Washington, school has not yet started for them. But you can see here on the screen, we're very proud uh, and thrilled really at how adventurous our class of 2023 was in where they chose to apply and where they chose to enroll. And we're particularly proud of the merit scholarships that our students were offered. Um, really exciting to work with them. And now we are of course shifting our attention wholeheartedly to the class of 2024. Okay. Moving ahead. Okay, we're gonna turn it back over. I'm, I'm gonna stop talking. We're gonna turn it over now to our panelists. So we're going to begin uh, by having each of our panelists introduce themselves and just give a little background about their, their background in admissions uh, and, and uh, answer a few questions. And then we'll come back and move, move continue moving forward with our program. Cool, thanks so much, Megan. And thank you all so much for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Ben Siegel. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the senior admissions counselor at the University of Washington um, down the road there in Seattle. I'm originally born and raised in Seattle. Um, I went to UW and graduated back in 2016. Um, worked in kind of college access a little bit, and then worked at the UW Bothell campus for a few years. And then I've been at the UW Seattle campus for about three and a half years here at this point. Um, so excited to be able to connect with you all here, especially as a, I'm a Seattleite and someone kind of went through this um, process thinking about should I stay close to home, go far away, um, not too long ago myself. Um, but I'll start and just give a really quick overview about the UW as I know you all are local here. I don't want to dive too deep into the specifics of UW right in the moment. Um, mostly just want to talk about our incoming class um, and some just quick little notes before getting further into our admissions process later on. But University of Washington, we are a public four-year university located here in Seattle, Washington. Um, we have about 180 different majors here at the UW. We are a large research institution, so UW receives more federal funding for research than any other public school in the U.S. Um, and then as a side note on that um, size piece, we have about 33 
thousand undergraduate students here at the UW, so large campus there. Um, as it relates to our recent um, applicant pool, especially for our incoming class here in fall 2023, um, we joined the Common App starting um, for that fall 2023 application, and we received an increase of applications from about 52,000 to 62,000. So um, large number of applications coming into UW these days. Um, out of all those students, and we admit roughly half of those students, and we always give priority to Washington residents in that review process. Um, in our incoming class here at the UW, just over 7,000 students, about two thirds of those students are Washington residents. And again, as a public school here in the state of Washington, again, our primary commitment is to serving and enrolling Washington residents. Um, I guess a few other little side notes on that pool coming into the UW. Um, incoming classes here, about 30% first generation college students. Um, we provide a variety of support through our um, Office of Minority Affairs and Diversity and Multicultural Outreach and Recruitment team to um, students of color, low income, first generation college students, as well as foster youth throughout that application process and after they enroll here at the UW. Um, in terms of some trends for majors and popular majors here at the UW, I mean, probably the most popular ones these days, it might be obvious, but like computer science, engineering, psychology, biology, and other pre-med related majors, um, as well as some interest in the college and the environment. We have a variety of majors there ranging from marine biology to environmental science to atmospheric sciences. Um, but definitely seen some interest in those majors recently. Um, hopefully some helpful information for you all, especially as you're diving into this application process a little bit. Um, again, about 180 majors at the UW. The vast majority of those majors do not directly admit freshmen um, here at the UW. Um, only about 20% of our freshmen come in directly admitted to their chosen major here at the UW, but there are 80% of students coming as pre-major students, so totally normal to come in as a pre-major student um, before applying to or declaring their chosen major after about a year or two. Um, but we really want to allow students like that opportunity to explore a little bit, dabble in some different classes um, before deciding on their chosen major here at the UW. Um, and I can talk lots more about direct admission a little bit as well. Um, I think another thing that we've seen a little bit recently and respond to this as well, um, high demand for those computer science and other, I'd say, tech related majors here at UW. And we recognize we don't always have capacity to accommodate all students in those majors. So we added a data science minor a couple of years ago. Um, and I think this really allows students, regardless of major, to you know take a few classes um, related to that field of study um, and just kind of think about how um, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary their education can be here at the UW. And you do not have to be a computer science major to take computer science classes. So obviously that shows up across other subject areas, but definitely something that's been, uh, I'd say, trending here at UW recently. Um, uh, but here at the UW, we also have an interdisciplinary honors program. And I know I saw a question about that in the chat. So I'll just give a really quick overview of that honors program and then just some notes on enrollment for this class. But the interdisciplinary honors program here at the UW, um, not a major, not a minor. Um, students across all majors here at the UW can participate in that interdisciplinary honors program. Um, those classes are taught by faculty around campus, and those classes are going to be made up of students across all majors around campus here at the UW. Um, the topics themselves, um, you know, there's one recently was a class about like artificial intelligence and just thinking about how can we approach this from um, different areas of study um, in students' academic backgrounds, as well as their experience outside the classroom too. Um, average honors class size is about 30 students here at the UW. So just one of those many ways to have a smaller community here at the UW. In terms of the honors, application process of the UW students just need to submit an extra honors essay um, as part of the UW application. And we enroll about roughly 230 students into the honors program in a given year. That's what it was um, our last year here. Um, my last little notes I'll touch on, we are test optional here at the UW and that's new as of our fall 2021 application cycle, I believe here. Um, I know test optional means something slightly different everywhere, but here at the UW, you're welcome to submit test scores. Um, they're never gonna hurt you in our review process, but if you have really strong test scores, like over a 1400 on the SAT, or over a 31 on the ACT, um, those could potentially help for a very small number of students. Um, we had about, again, over 60,000 applications and looked at test scores for a couple hundred students this last year. So for the vast majority of students, we're not gonna see test scores. They're not gonna impact a student's application. Um, I guess my last two pieces down here, I know we were asked to kind of share some like traditions or hidden gems at the UW. I feel like you all being in Seattle probably know some of the maybe common traditions at the UW, but I'll, I'll toss out some hidden gems. Um, on campus, we do have a UW farm located in the Union Bay Natural Area, which is um, kind of just off to the side of campus in between our campus and Laurelhurst, but there's a big farm over there, um, kind of a cool area, and they're really building it out, as well as the UW um, reopened its greenhouse, which is right up the Burke Gilman Trail on the south side of campus, kind of across from the hospital. Um, that's 
open to the public one day a week. So just some cool little areas to check out around campus um, on your campus tour if you're just looking for um, a nice walk around a natural area on campus. Um, and then I guess my last little words of wisdom that I may pass along and I will be popping on here later. Um, I know there's a lot of pressure throughout this whole college search and application process. And obviously everyone here today, we're here to support throughout that process and help answer your questions and hopefully take a little bit of that stress away. Um, but I know there's a, a lot of pressure to find like the best college. Um, and absolutely like, you know, looking at rankings can be one part of that puzzle, but I really encourage students to think about what's that best fit for themselves. And that could be school, major location, um, and just kind of think critically and keep an open mind throughout this process. So like, absolutely, um, you know, focus on your goals, like chase your dreams. But um, I think it's important to keep an open mind throughout that process because you never know what's going to um, spark your interests along the way here. Uh, but that's all I'll, I'll touch on um, right in the moment here. And I'll be back in a little bit to talk more about UW and public um, colleges and universities here. Thank you, Ben. We'll turn it over to Siobhan. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Siobhan Coleman, and I am the Assistant Director of Admission here at Holy Cross. Um, I say here, even though I'm in Tennessee, so it's a little bit confusing. Um, so I have worked in admissions for almost three years. Um, I did a, a year and a half at a smaller private college in Massachusetts on the graduate side, and then I've been at Holy Cross for a year and a half. Um, actually, tomorrow will be a year and a half at the college. I have covered the Pacific Northwest for the entirety of my time at Holy Cross, and I've traveled there three times already. Um, I come through on the Jesuit Excellence Tour, which is where um, a group of admissions counselors from, um, we had a group of 14 of us, I believe, this past May come through Seattle and uh, Portland, and we do college tours, and Holy Names is always on our list. It's one of my favorite stops to make. And a little bit about um, Holy Cross in general. So we are a small Jesuit Catholic liberal arts institution located in Worcester, Massachusetts. Worcester is in the very center of the state. It's about an hour west of Boston. And Worcester is the second largest city in New England. There are 200,000 people and it's also considered a college town because we have 35,000 college students at eight um, across eight institutions in the city. Um, Holy Cross, I've just mentioned, is a Jesuit Catholic school. Um, we are um, we're a welcoming space for students of all faith backgrounds, students of no faith, faith background. We like to say that we are Catholic and a welcoming place for all. It's a wonderful pl place to further your Catholic faith if you are. And if, it's, and if you are not, it's a wonderful place to have a well-rounded liberal arts education influenced by Je Jesuit values. Um, we have over 60 majors in academic programs. We have interdisciplinary programs. We have um, a business program. We are all one college. So when you're applying to Holy Cross, there are no individual colleges of business versus the College of Humanities. We are just the College of Holy Cross. So you are not applying to a specific major. You're just indicating areas of academic interest. Um, on your application. We have students that will check off up to 15 areas that they might be interested in, and this has, has no influence on if they're getting admitted to the college. It's just giving us, as admission counselors and application readers, an idea of what students are interested in, and but we are not admitting by majors at Holy Cross. So our, some of our most popular majors that we have are economics and psychology. They are tied for 18% of the student body for each majoring in those um, in those subjects in the graduating class. Following, we have political science, English, and biology. So kind of your traditional liberal arts majors that you might think of are the most popular amongst our students. We also have a, an incredibly strong pre-med program. It's actually a pre-med advising office at Holy Cross. Um, so it's kind of a track, but it really is just an advising office that's a resource to our students to plan out their courses, to have the most, um, the best looking transcript for those medical school applications. Also for students interested in, in applying to a PA program or a PT program um, also can use this office. They um, also connect students with internship opportunities and shadowing opportunities. There are two major hospital systems located in the city of Worcester. So there's um, a plenty of opportunity for students to get hands-on experience in the medical field during their time at Holy Cross. And 
students interested in pre-med are also able to have a health studies major, which is a self-designed major, where students can take um, courses in a, um, a bunch of different subjects, including biology and neuroscience or psychology to kind of craft their own major and eventually um, apply to any type of medical program after Holy Cross. We, um, I don't remember if I just mentioned this, we have an 83% acceptance rate to medical school at Holy Cross. Um, now I will, oh, I'll talk a little bit about test optional as well. At Holy Cross, we've been test optional since 2005. So that is longer than um, all the high school students have been alive. Um, so we really do mean optional at Holy Cross. If you choose to submit your test scores, um, it's um, because hopefully it's because you're proud of them and you think that um, standardized testing really represents your academic abilities. However, if you are not a, a, a strong standardized test taker, you're wavering on whether or not to submit your test scores. At Holy Cross, um, we say don't. Um, we like to look at your transcript over your standardized test scores because your transcript is representative of, um, of the time that you apply three and a half years of work, whereas at the standardized test is just a representation of a four hour period on a Saturday morning, and that's not how college works. Um, so we have a long-standing policy of test optional that is not going away ever. Um, also, I'll mention merit scholarship opportunities before I get into our um, what our income in class looks like. We do have merit-based aid available at Holy Cross. It's on a, at, available at Holy Cross. It's on a very limited basis because um, we prim primarily offer need-based aid. However, merit-based aid is available. There is no separate application to be eligible for merit-based aid. Every single applicant is considered for it through the application review process, and it's distributed to the very top of the admitted pool of students. So the strongest students that got straight A's in the most rigorous classes um, at given high schools. Um, now I'll tell you a little bit about the class of 2027, who we just welcomed to campus three weeks ago. So this was our largest, um, we had set a record of applications this year at the college. It was the most competitive um, cycle that we've ever had at Holy Cross. We had a 23% increase in applications and we also had the lowest proportion of applicants admitted at 21%. Um, the college also achieved a record 45% yield, so the percentage of admitted students who chose to enroll at the college was 45% this past year. And then the incoming class, we welcome students from 531 different high schools, from 38 um, U.S. states and territories, and 12 different countries. This incoming class represents one of the most diverse and academically accomplished classes in the college history. And by percentage, the class of 2027 includes more students of color, Appell eligible students, and first generation students than the preceding class. Um, so we're very excited to welcome those students to campus. Um, they had a, a lot of really great and interesting achievements, and we're looking forward to meeting um, this next round of applicants. Um, okay, then now I can get into uh, some lighter aspects of Holy Cross. Um, so we are a registered arboretum. So we have over 100 species of trees and shrubs on Holy Cross's campus. So it is very beautiful. Um, we also have a greenhouse on campus. So it's a very, um, even though it's New England and we do have um, harsh winters, we still have um, beautiful spring and fall seasons um, with all of the trees blooming. And we also have a tradition called Midnight Breakfast, which is do, um, during the finals period in both fall and spring semester, um, where faculty and staff will serve um, breakfast to students at starting at like 11 o'clock at night to kind of help them help to support them during the finals period. And lastly, I will just give um, offer a piece of advice for the seniors and the families that are getting started in this application process. Um, this is coming from um, the perspective of an only child. So I would rec I'd recommend to the students and parents to really enjoy this process because I know it's very stressful, but it also is a really special time in your life. Um, you're never going to do this again. 
it's um, probably the most that you'll be talking to your parents about the same subject. And even though you might get frustrated with each other at, at times, it can be really fun to visit colleges and kind of narrow it down. And it's certainly fun and exciting once you're waiting for acceptances and decisions. Oh, we think that Siobhan may have frozen. So we'll we'll turn off her video for the moment, poor thing. Anna, we'll turn it over to you if you're ready to, to take the, the baton for Oberlin. Thank you. Yeah, I wasn't sure if I had froze. I was like, oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank well, you. Hello. Yeah, no problem. Hello, everyone. My name is Anna Richardson. I like she, her, hers. I'm one of the senior assistant directors of admissions at Oberlin College. Um, but I am an OB, so I did go to Oberlin. Uh, I graduated in 2018. I studied psych and neuro there, did track there, a bunch of other stuff. Um, but more importantly, I am from the West Coast, so I'm originally from Eugene, Oregon, and I decided to go to Ohio and live in a small town and still work there now. Um, I promise you it's because it's a great place. Um, but I have been in admissions for five years and I have been on the West Coast for uh, the Pacific Northwest for the last three years. So definitely visit Holy Names. I'm very familiar, always happy when I'm on the West Coast to try to get some West Coast folks um, to our campus. Um, so to kind of give just an overview of um, Oberlin. So we're located in the town of Oberlin, Ohio. Um, Oberlin, Ohio is a small town. The college and the town are actually founded together way back in 1833. So we've never really existed without the other. Um, so it kind of makes for this really quintessential kind of college town where you're able to walk around and also run into, you know, a middle school, you'll see kids, you'll see an old folks home, all different types of businesses, etc. cetera. Um, a part of Oberlin is definitely our history. So by 1837, we actually became the first school to admit folks regardless of race and gender. So if you're thinking of the time, it's definitely something that wasn't popular. Um, what we say at Oberlin is the things that seem radical today on Oberlin's campus always end up being kind of the norms of everyone else. So we also were the first to go co-educational, a lot of those pieces. Um, all that to say is we attract a lot of students who are very invested in social justice, um, those types of things. Um, and on top of that, we have actually committed ourselves to carbon neutrality by 2025. So that's some of our decent history background us today, um, so we're small private liberal arts, we're kind of on the larger side of small schools, so around 2,900 students that we have fully undergraduate, so we don't have any graduate students, all classes are taught by professors at Oberlin, um, but we do share our campus with the Conservatory of Music. So the Conservatory of Music is actually the longest running conservatory in the United States, um, and students who study in the conservatory are actually going for pre-professional musicians, like bachelors of uh, music. So that's like, you know, they're working with one professor, they're doing ensembles, they're practicing six, seven, eight hours a day, that kind of thing. Um, and then the college I work for is the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, although we are two separate colleges, so two separate admissions processes, all the students in the college do dine and live with everybody else. So you'll see a lot of crossover with music just throughout our school. Um, for us, we're truly liberal arts. So you know that open curriculum, you don't have to declare until the end of your second year. So if you're thinking about applying, we're definitely not just looking at um, what majors you're applying into. Um, there are some special programs where if you are a STEM major and you do really, really well, there might be um, a scholarship that you might get additionally. Um, and then also for students of color who are interested in STEM, um, once we admit our class, we identify a bunch of students that we want them to do research with a mentor so that's part of our strong program. So that's the only time where your majors might affect something later on in the process, but you have a lot of time to kind of figure it out. Um, as you heard, I was a double major. 60% of our students are actually double majors at Oberlin. So very, very often folks are doing lots of things. And that's kind of one of the things we love. If you're thinking about popular majors, um, we have 80 different majors and you know, with the 2,900 students, all of our majors are not huge. Um, so I'll just talk about some that have traditionally done really, really well. Um, so political science, law and society. So we have around a 97% acceptance rate to law school. Um, biology has been really strong for a long time. And Oberlin actually had the first 
um, undergraduate neuroscience department in the nation, um, computer science, you know, Google loves our graduates. We have lots of folks that go to Google um, and then things like math, econ and metrics. Um, so things with econ, business, that type of stuff are definitely popular at Oberlin. Um, but what I will say with the double majors, that doesn't mean a lot because a lot of people can be doing a lot of different things. Um, Outside of that, we do have it. we have research on campus, $5 million from the National Science Foundation. So that's kind of a big piece. Um, and then for internships, we do guarantee at least $5,000 for low paid or unpaid internships at any point in the student's career. Um, and then finally, the other unique kind of different thing is we do have a winter term. So our month of January is just dedicated to a project of some sort there. Um, for our incoming class that we had this year. Um, so over the pandemic, we had great years, record numbers of applications. Um, this last year, we were kind of just right on par. We didn't see our huge jump that we have in the last couple of years. So we're still really happy with it. Um, we got around 11,000 applications to make a class of around 800 students for our incoming class. Um, for the folks we admitted, around 49 different states were represented and then 49 different countries. Um, so around 95% of our students are also out of state. So, you know, you're in a small town in Ohio, but then you have like, you know, the New Yorkers walking really quickly, which I learned later, us West Coasters, we walk slow apparently. Um, and then you also do have all of those international students. If you're thinking about different schools, around 60% of our students were from public schools. The other were for independent or private schools. Um, and then we are a test optional school. So around 65% of our students did apply test optional. And then we admitted around 55% of our students that um, were test optional. So there's a little bit difference there, but students who typically submit their scores have higher scores. So that's kind of explains that piece. All that to say is if you want to submit your scores, you should. Um, we're not a place where if you submit it, it can't like quote unquote hurt you, but your, your actual testing is only one piece of a larger academic rating for us. So it's not like testing gives you X, Y, and Z points. Um, it does, if you submit it, we're going to look at it and use it, but you do not have to. Um, we also do super scored tests and you can, um, you can just self-report until you've been admitted to Oberlin. And then if you decide to come to us, then you'd have to kind of send in those pieces there. Um, I'm, let me make sure I'm hitting all the things. I always get distracted when I'm talking around here. Um, oh yeah, traditions and things. So Oberlin is definitely kind of a quirky place. We have a lot of weird things, um, but one of the things that kind of stands out and is very different that I feel like now I take for granted, um, we have the Allen Art Museum on campus and it's actually has, we have the third largest collection of art on any college campus after Harvard and Yale. Um, and this is a teaching museum. So like, you know, art classes in there, chemistry brings them in there, talk about pigmentation, um, but I digress. 80 years ago, the director of the museum decided that she was tired of seeing all these pieces sit in the basement of the museum because how big our collection was. Um, and she was gonna rent out original pieces of art to students. Um, it still lives today, it's been 80 years. Nobody will insure us because we're giving out original art pieces to 18 to 22 year olds. Um, but I'm happy to say in the 80 years, nothing's ever been lost, stolen or damaged. Damaged, So students can actually rent up to two pieces uh, a semester. There is a Picasso in there. It's like a big thing to see who ends up with the Picasso every year. Um, so it's kind of just a testament to how much Oberlin students are trusted um, in those types of things. Um, for our actual application, we're a school that uses early decision and regular decision. Um, we don't have an application fee, no additional essay, and we're also test optional there too. So pretty straightforward on that side. Um, and then we're lucky enough to be a school that meets 100% of demonstrated need. Um, and so that's based off of the CSS and that free federal application for student aid. Um, and so based off of that, we can fill in with scholarships, grants, work study, and then a little bit of loans. Um, if you're looking at national college debt, unfortunately, right now, it's anywhere between that like 36,000 to 42,000. Um, and you're seeing Oberlin students getting out on average with around 22 to 26. Um, and of the students we offer loans, only around 60% of the, or only around 40% of those students actually take the loans we're offering them. So that's to say, I think that means that we're giving competitive packages to people to be able to kind of decline those. Um, but we also do offer merit. So 
we guarantee at least $10,000 in merit just by being admitted. And then those packages are much like Holy Cross, just based on your kind of academic record that you've had there. Um, a lot of times we people are surprised by our financial aid packets. So you might be scared by the huge sticker price, um, but know that nobody pays that. Um, I'm first gen, low income student. So I was actually able to go through Oberlin and come out with no loans. Um, so a lot of really cool things that we can do with providing access in those spaces. Um, and then I hope I hit everything, but last but not least, a piece of advice. Um, so for the students, for the parents, what I'll say is in this college process, it's super easy to kind of get really caught up on all the things you should have done or what can you do for this or X, Y, and Z. Um, through the process, I'd say really think about what you can control. So for students, you know, that's thinking about what classes you're selecting to choose, uh, to take. Are you challenging yourself? Are you going to do well in those classes and the ones you're challenging yourself in? Um, but also looking at what are the things you want to add to your application. You can't change how you did in the past. You can't change what extracurriculars you did. So senior year, don't join 10 clubs thinking that's going to make a difference. Really think about who you are today and kind of put that forward. Um, we're looking for a variety of people. There's not one kind of person we're looking for. So I always try to tell people, just keep the things that you can have in control, in control and the rest of it, you know, it's just going to happen and you're going to find a home either way. Thank you to all three of our panelists and, and for those of you who have been with us since the beginning, Siobhan from Holy Cross had some internet challenges, but she's back with us. We're gonna, we're gonna continue to move ahead um, with our program and we're happy that the internet stabilized for her uh, where she is in Tennessee. Speakers, if you could take a, a, a quick glance at some of the questions that have come through. There are a couple of themes we're seeing about ED versus regular decision about financial aid. When you when you and I know that some of these will be specific to Siobhan to to Anna, especially about ED versus regular. Um, we will also um, this is probably more for you, Ben. The question about engineering and maybe fold in computer science and that sort of thing. We're going to turn it over now. We're at we're at six twenty here. Just keeping an eye on our time as we're moving. Um, again. Families, please feel free to put questions into the Q&A. We will attempt to uh, have our speakers address them um, publicly, but otherwise we will be responding through the chat. So Ben, we'll turn it over to you to just talk a little bit about larger public universities and maybe talking about uh, the nuances of engineering and computer science and so on. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll do my best to speak to large public universities. Um, I, I guess I'll say, like, I worked at UW Bothell and UW Seattle, and they're even both part of the UW system. There's a lot of differences between those two schools. So I'll mostly focus on UW here, but hopefully some of the topics I touch on um, just kind of spark some potential questions and topic of conversation as you're checking out other large public universities. Um, but I think one thing that rings true for large public universities is kind of serving the residents of that state, and I think that will show up in a variety of ways. Um, again, here at the University of Washington, um, whether it's our overall admit rate and you know, the Washington resident admit rate this last year was around like 53, 54%, um, going to be higher by about some more five to 10 percentage points than folks coming from outside the state of Washington. Um, for direct admit rates to majors, for direct admission to like computer science, for example, the Washington resident admit rates about like 20 to 25% for out of state, it's about 2%. So there is always that like priority given to Washington residents in the admissions process there. Uh, tuition, um, in-state tuition gonna be significantly less than out of state tuition. Our in-state's just over 12,000, out of state's just over 40,000. Um, so those are kind of some of those big pieces when thinking about the public in-state schools versus out-of-state schools. Um, I know there's a lot of nuance to that, especially for those of you who may be familiar with the um, Western Undergraduate Exchange or WUI um, and other reciprocity agreements like that. Um, Last thing I'll kind of touch on as it relates to like the preference for in-state, um, something we have here in the state of Washington um, or at the UW Medical School um, is the WAMI program. And essentially it means that UW is the medical school that serves students who are residents of Washington, Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho. Um, so even at that like medical school level, thinking about residency can still be important there. Um, 
I guess some other pieces I'll touch on really quickly here, like for large schools, such as the University of Washington, um, those of you who've been on campus or been around the campus, like, you know, it kind of feels like a, a little city in itself. Um, and I think with a, a large school like the UW, it really is up to students to be proactive um, in seeking out those resources that they need to be successful, as well as like building those smaller communities around campus. Um, and again, that could be through housing, that could be through Greek life, that could be through joining student clubs or playing intramural sports or volunteering, for example. Um, I'd say there's so much going on at the UW, and I know sometimes it can feel overwhelming at a large school. Um, we do have a variety of like resources, whether that's advising orientation, first year interest groups, um, as well. There are other events that we have during our dog days welcome week. Um, but I think at those big schools, there's going to be um, a little bit more um, probably responsibility on the student to to build out some of those. Um, Oops, sorry, so, um, to, uh, to build those communities. Um, but that's kind of some of my overviews of like student life, large school. Um, I'm gonna talk about the UW admissions process really quick. And again, this varies a bit school by school, but hopefully helps just a little bit. Um, we do a holistic review process here at the UW and I'm sure we're looking at a student's academic preparation and performance. That's kind of our leading pillar of our review process, but also looking at a student's personal achievements and characteristics. So essays and other information provided on the application. Um, every application that comes into UW, all 62,000 of them, they are read by humans, read multiple times there, um, looking at well beyond the student's GPA um, at, at, when reading that application. Um, some things that may be helpful to note here, um, at the UW, we just look at what's on that admissions application. We do not read or consider letters of recommendation. We do not consider demonstrated interest. We do not do admissions interviews or consider, say, conversations we've had with students when reading that application, um, as well as we don't consider like legacy or alumni status. So I always tell students like whatever you feel like you want us to know, it's up to you to provide that in the application itself. Um, between the academics, um, the personal statement, short response essay, activity log, as well as our three additional information sections, you're going to have plenty of space to communicate that information to us. But um, UW's admissions process is very student driven in terms of um, students. It's up to them to submit that application and provide all the information that they want us to know when reading that application itself. Um, I know there's a question about majors, and I didn't touch on it too much in the past, but on the UW application, you have to list a first choice major, um, and then you can list a second choice major if you're open to doing so, but you can only list two majors on the application. Um, you're not committing to these two majors, you're just kind of letting us know that you're interested in these fields of study, and that is something that we may consider about, um, may consider as part of our holistic review process, like what majors you're interested in studying, if you're open to studying multiple majors, and also thinking about the capacity of those majors. So major alone is it going to be like the make or break in your admission decision? Um, but it's one of the many factors that we consider there. Um, specifically for direct admission, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but the vast majority of majors here at UW do not offer direct admission. So about 80% of our students come in as like pre-major undeclared students. Our big direct admit majors are going to be computer science as well as the majors in the College of Engineering. Um, if you want to study computer science or engineering, just be sure to list as your first choice major on the application. And by doing so, you're automatically considered for direct admission to those majors. Um, our process and message for you is that you, if you are, say, directly admitted to computer science, you are guaranteed that major here at the UW, and you do not have to apply later on. However, if you're admitted to UW, but not to computer science, our message to you is, yes, you can still come to the UW, but you should plan to study something besides computer science. Um, similar message for engineering, but some engineering majors might have a little bit more capacity than others, and I can drop a link there um, with a little bit more information about that. But in short, especially if you want to study computer science or engineering, be sure to list those as your first choice major on the application. Um, I guess my last few pieces I want to touch on here. Um, let me see, make sure I'm not forgetting anything. We just have one application deadline, November 15th. So one regular decision deadline applied by November 15th. We have one notification time frame, and that is March 1st through 15th. So I know a little different than other schools there in November 15th does come up early, but again, that is our one and only application deadline here at the UW. Um, the last thing I'll touch on here really quick is I know we get a lot of questions recently um, with the uh, new Supreme Court ruling on affirmative action in college admissions, get a lot of questions about how that's going to impact our, our processes here in the state of Washington and at the UW. Um, for those of you who may not be aware, in I think it was 1990 passed I-200, which essentially um, banned schools like the UW from looking at race um, as part of the admissions process. So um, from talking to my colleagues over the last few months, we don't anticipate really any changes in our process is that um, was already in place here in the state of Washington in 1998 there. 
Um, last thing I'll touch on here before passing along to my colleagues, um, I know we just touching on like the role of parents in this process. I mean, I think I, I welcome parents in this process. I recognize you all are going to bring um, a variety of different perspectives and see things that maybe um, based on your experience as a student may not in that process. Um, so we welcome you on campus tours. If you want to connect with us, always happy to do so. Um, but I do encourage you to like empower and support your student to sit in the driver's seat um, and take the lead in a lot of different situations. Um, just for example, when students schedule like a phone appointment, with me. Um, I think oftentimes like the parent being there can really help to fill in some of those gaps, but I encourage that student to um, be the driving force in that phone appointment. Um, I know it may feel um, nerve wracking potentially to talk to a college admissions counselor, but hopefully it doesn't. Um, I think especially at UW because we're not tracking demonstrated interest. Um, there's no bad questions. It uh, doesn't matter if uh, you're nervous or you're awkward, like those things are not going to impact your application. We're just always be here, always here to connect with you all and support throughout um, the application process when and if those questions come up. Um, that's all I'll leave in the moment here. Um, and I know I'll be doing some Q&A later. Thank you so much, Ben. Siobhan, we think that your internet might have stabilized for you. So if you're if you'd like to give it a give it a go again, we'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I will start by talking about some observations about private Catholic schools um, in your college search process. Um, so when you're looking at Catholic schools, just keep in mind that the uh, Catholicism can look different at different different Catholic institutions. So that depends on where you're looking at um, in this country, like the region that you're looking at. Um, it depends on this, the, even the state that you're looking at and how they embrace their Catholic identity can, um, certainly will look different in terms of masses. Um, do they offer mass on a daily basis? Do they require students to go to mass at Holy Cross? We we never require students to go to mass. Um, they never have to go into the chapel if they don't want to. And if they would like to attend mass every single day, they are welcome to. Um, you want to look at their campus ministry. Um, is campus ministry welcoming of all faith backgrounds? Um, is it um, is there an office of college chaplains in addition to campus ministry that is tied to um, the masses and the Catholic rituals? Um, you want to look at for Catholic schools if they have um, religious course requirements and what those course requirements look like. Um, at Holy Cross, we just have one religious studies course requirement. So you're welcome to take a course on any religion. There's interdisciplinary um, uh, courses on that fall under religious studies. So it really can be more of a um, ex exploratory um, course rather than um, just learning about Catholicism as you would at your Catholic high school. So there's more um, knowledge to be had there. You want to look at the service um, opportunities and what the relationship with the community is that a Catholic college has. Um, are they are living up to those Catholic values of giving back to others. And at Holy Cross, we have a Jesuit identity where um, we believe in serving and being people for others um, or men and women for others, but we like to be more inclusive and say people. Um, finally, if you're looking at Jesuit colleges, um, there are 27 in the, um, in, in the United States. And all of us look a little bit different. We all embrace our Jesuit identity a little bit differently. Um, at Holy Cross, we def definitely emphasize a welcoming community and a supportive community for all students. Um, we welcome students of all gender identities. We welcome non-binary students, students of all sexual orientations. Our campus is intended to be a safe space for students of all backgrounds, um, of both um, and, and, and of course for students of color. So our Jesuit identity at Holy Cross is um, caring more about service, caring about um, giving back to the community. And um, as I said, be, uh, it's also um, a focus on mind, body, and spirit. Um, it's called Cura Personalis, that's a Jesuit tenet, and it means a care of the whole person. So students at Holy Cross are looking to further themselves um, through in all three of those areas, mind, body, and spirit. So now talking about our applications. So I will get into um, what happens to an application, how, um, how we review it, and how it's processed. So once we receive your common application um, from Holy Names, we also accept QuestBridge applicants and the coalition application. 
Um, they are all organized based on our territories. We do two reads at Holy Cross, so two um, actual people like myself read your applications. The first um, admission counselor that reads the application is the assigned counselor. So for Holy Names, I will be the first reader on the application on your applications. Um, because I visited the high school, I know um, what your high school, um, what the course, what courses you offer, what um, type of rigor you offer, your GPA scale, and how many rigorous courses you have um, per grade. Also, any limitations on um, how many classes you can take, any scheduling limitations I'll be aware of, because Megan Angelica will have informed me about that. Um, so that is the reason that we have the assigned admission counselor read the application first, because they're familiar with the school and all of the nuances. Um, specifically at Holy Cross, we're not recalculating GPA. So this is also helpful for us to um, what in being knowledgeable of the individual high schools because we know the GPA scale. We know if it's weighted or unweighted, um, and we know um, what what it means in in terms of the individual high school. So after the first reader, um, it goes on to a second reader. So another um, admission counselor within the office assigned usually um, at random. Our, our director definitely has a system, but it's usually just dependent on um, the speed of our of our readers and how um, how experienced they are. So of course, more experienced counselors are going to have a larger reading um, caseload and. Um, for example, I was a new reader this past year, but I read 975 applications through first and second reads. But our um, deputy deputy director, who has been in the field for almost 20 years, he read 35,000, uh, 3,500, excuse me, applications. So um, they're divided basically based on skill for the second reader. And after that, we have a committee. Um, so we all come together as an admissions team, and we look at every application in a in a group. The groups are of different sizes. They um, change week to week, um, but they all always have a minimum of three admission counselors in a given committee. Um, we look at e each individual application. We look at the transcript more closely. We may look at interview notes. We may um, dive into a particular recommendation letter. Um, it all depends on the individual application and what the reader notes have been. Um, and then after committee, um, we're organizing the files into um, uh, first, first round decisions, uh, but the final decision is never made within committee. Um, so we're tagging those, those applications as um, potential admits, we're tagging them as potential waitlists and potential denies, but no final decisions are made in our discuss um, discussion committee. Um, at once those files are tagged, they're moved forward to to our decision makers, who are our di uh, director, deputy director, and our vice president of enrollment. There are also members of financial aid involved in that conversation, as well as the academic dean's office and the president's office. Um, so the decisions, the final decisions come from those decision makers, but um, us admission counselors have a very active voice in the application review process. Um, the, so we're also looking at early, de early decision and regular decision applications. A little bit differently. We're only looking at early decision applications differently because we have to process them on a um, an, on a quicker um, timeline. So our early decision applications, we typically like to release a decision within one month of the application deadline. That will change this year as a result of the FAFSA um, have become it, coming out later. So we won't be able to give. Um, accepted students full financial aid packages without the FAFSA being filled out. So there, we don't have a set de, um, date yet on when we will be releasing our early decision decisions, um, but it won't be that um, one month after the application as we typically like it to be. Um, so I will, so now I'll get into the difference between early decision and regular decision, specifically at Holy Cross. So for early decision, as Meg mentioned earlier tonight, early decision is a binding agreement. So it means that if you are accepted to Holy Cross, you agree to attend. Um, 
And there was a question about financial aid for early decision. And we recommend really doing your research on with using the net, net price calculator and other um, financial tools to get a really good estimation of what your financial aid package may be. Um, we meet full demonstrated need at Holy Cross, and that is made up of a combination of scholarships, grants, um, work study, and federal loans, um, loans being packaged less. So the number that, um, that comes up in those tools like the net price calculator is typically pretty, pretty close to the nose of what your financial aid package will be from Holy Cross. Um, so for early decision, we have two deadlines. We have a November 15th deadline, and we also have a January 15th deadline. The only, excuse me, the only difference between those two is where you're personally at timing-wise in your college application process. So if at the beginning of November, you are 100% all in on Holy Cross or any school, the X school that you're looking to, do, to apply to early decision, um, you are welcome we recommend if you know what's your number one, um, you've done your homework on the finances, apply for that early decision one deadline. If you're still kind of narrowing it down between two or three colleges by November 15th, take a little bit more time and see, um, maybe do another visit, maybe talk with your counselor, the admission counselor at that school another time, then you can apply for the early decision two deadline at Holy Cross, which is January 15th. There is no difference in acceptance rate between early decision one and early decision two. Um, so the, the only difference is really timing in your own personal process. Then we have regular decision. Um, that deadline is January 15th as well. Um, it's not a binding commitment. It's just a standard um, application deadline. And we offer decisions of admit, waitlist, and deny. Um, we also very rarely defer students um, in from early decision. They typically are either accepted or denied from, in early decision. It's um, very uncommon for us to defer. Back to regular decision, we admit, waitlist, or deny. We did admit students off of our waitlist this year for the first time in about 20 years. Um, and we, uh, we expect to do that again this year, most likely. And finally, I did touch on test optional um, in my introduction earlier, um, but just to reiterate, we really do mean optional at Holy Cross. Um, when you're considering other colleges that you're applying to, just take a quick look at how long they've had a test optional policy. If it is a longer standing relationship with being test optional, it's, if it's been since the 2000s or the early 2010s, you can, I think you can be pretty confident that that school really is not valuing uh, test scores at at a high level, um, that they really are putting more emphasis on the student's transcript in their application review. If the school um, implemented test optional during COVID, I definitely would be more, um, not skeptical, but more um, take a more measured approach and really think about about um, what your test scores is, if they're what your test scores are, if they're falling in the average range of the, of that school. I would recommend submitting them if they are if they have a newer test optional policy. But for the schools um, like Holy Cross, they really do mean optional. Um, I think I touched upon everything, so I will pass it on to Anna. Thank you so much, Siobhan. All right, Anna, we are we're heading into the final. And if you could, I, again, we have a few pen uh, comments that are still out there in our chat about ED and their um, particularly about the financial aid. And I think I think I I'm, I heard Siobhan say it, and Anna, maybe you can add to it. But there is the one reason that a family truly can break a, a binding early decision agreement is if the financial aid is not appropriate. Anna, I'll let you carry on with that and offer your perspective from Oberlin and mm -hmm. uh, the remainder of your presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, so the comment about early decision and the finances of it. Um, the other piece is some schools do offer like an early estimate kind of thing. So at least at Oberlin, um, if you're someone who's like, 
Oberlin's the number one choice. I want to go here. I don't want to go anywhere else. Um, if you submit your application by November 1st and also the CSS profile, um, our financial aid office can actually give you, here's what your financial aid package would look like if you decide to actually commit for early decision before you do it. Um, so I know that we have it. I'm not sure which other schools have it, but I do know other people do it. So that's another option if you really are seriously taking that serious. Um, and then back to the net price calculator, those things are, you know, a lot of information to put in, but if you do it accurately, accurately um, for the schools that meet 100% of need and all of that, they'll be very close to what you can expect. Um, the other piece is, uh, at least in our financial aid office, and I'm sure other financial aid offices, um, if you do that kind of net price calculator and you make an appointment with the financial aid office, they can also kind of talk you through it to make sure you didn't mess up anything in that process. So generally, financial aid officers are really, really helpful for these things. Um, the other pieces like merit for some places when it's early decision, that can kind of be the thing that's up in the air. Um, and then finally, there is the tool called My Intuition. Um, this typically only works for folks who have decently straightforward finances, um, but basically it's a statistical tool that has taken uh, the financial aid packets of the last couple, I think it's five, last five years from different schools. Um, they take six different data points from those packages and you enter in, you know, know, a couple, six questions, and they give you a range of what your financial aid um, might look like. So what your need-based financial aid would be. That range is uh, about 10,000, um, 5,000 above or 5,000 below, below that. So that can just give you a decent sense of, is this a school where it's realistic for me to even be looking at with how my finances are? But again, if you have complicated finances, you might just want to do the net price calculator. Um, the other piece for, I had another question here about the differences in acceptance rate for early decision versus regular. At least at Oberlin, um, it's like double our admissions rate. So for us last year uh, in early decision, we admitted around 62% of all the students that applied versus if you're just looking at regular decision, we admitted around 25% of those students to kind of make that overall percent of that 35% we had last year. Um, so why is that? Typically, it's because we know that we can count on you as somebody who's going to come in our class. So we're always really excited when other people are excited about our schools. Um, some reasons people go early decision. A lot of athletes will go early decision because that's something that you kind of lock down early. Um, that's a lot of people that we're seeing. Um, or if you're someone who you're looking at that academic profile. So a lot of our schools are highly academic. Oberlin's average GPA unweighted is that uh, 3.7 and a 4.0. So we do actually core out and wait and recalculate all of your GPAs. Um, so you shouldn't worry about that. That's another thing. Control what you can control. So don't kind of worry about how we recalculate those things. Um, but anyways, that's kind of how ED works. Um, I will say over the last couple of years, there's been a large increase in schools filling their classes early decision, um, which makes it a little bit more difficult to get in in regular decision. But again, there's a wide variety of reasons why students get in. So you can't really point to one thing. Um, but that is something that is definitely a trend of more schools kind of filling their class earlier. Um, I know like Tulane has like super a lot of early action people. So then they don't accept that many people in regular. So those are some of kind of the trends um, for deferrals. So for students who come in and want to do gap years, there's a lot of different policies. So I say look it up at each school. Um, for Oberlin, we are happy to have deferral students, if you need to take a gap year, you apply to Oberlin, you say, I want a spot in the class, and then you request a deferral for a year. Um, there's a bit of a deposit that's involved in that, but different schools kind of have different policies. I know a lot of the small private liberal arts are typically happy and fine to see that um, as long as you're doing something kind of productive during that time. Um, for admission, so I mentioned that I work for the College of Arts and Science, but we do have a conservatory of music, so I'm going to kind of touch a little bit about the conservatory piece because that's a little bit different. Um, so conservatory applications are 100% talent-based. Um, so that means that you work with a professor, you do a pre-audition, um, their application deadline is December 1st. So typically those deadlines for conservatories are early. Um, there's a pre-screening. And then once the mate, once the actual faculties have said, oh, I'm interested in this student, they'll invite students to come to campus to actually do live auditions. And then with all the rest of the students, 
around that third week of March, you'll find out if you were accepted in the conservatory or not. Um, so typically these are, it's very much kind of like that grad school kind of feel where you have someone you work with all four years, you're very dedicated to it in that way. Um, but if you are interested in conservatories, definitely start talking to, if you have a private teacher or someone like that that you work with, they're usually very knowledgeable about the process. Um, and you can also do kind of lessons with professors ahead of time. If there's people at colleges you really wanna connect with and you're gonna visit, make sure you make time to sit in an you know, oratory schools skills class or any kind of thing like that. So that's kind of admissions. Conservatories, at least Oberlin's conservatory, is definitely a selective one. So we accept around 9% of the students who apply in the conservatory, but it does vary by actual, um, it varies by your instrument. So like if you play the organ, you know, there's a much higher acceptance rate than if you play the violin or piano. So those are some pieces. If you have more specific questions, because I don't know all the specifics about the conservatories, um, feel free to reach out. They all have their own admissions, usually offices and all that kind of stuff too. Um, I kind of touched a little bit, I mean, um, Holy Cross already touched a little bit kind of on the process. Our process is very similar for applications. We have a little bit different of a kind of reader setup, but it is multiple eyes are on your applications. Um, there is a committee review that happens and we do consider all different types of like pieces there. Um, Oberlin's different in the way that we do have optional interviews for students. Um, we do consider um, demonstrated interest because for, for us, it means it's someone that likes us. So if we admit you, you're more likely to come to Oberlin. So that's kind of how we use it. We don't use it as a detrimental factor where you need to have contact to be admitted. It's more like, oh, this is someone who's really cool. And we already know that they like us. Um, so that is something we keep in contact with. And a lot of the small private liberal arts or just smaller schools are able to have those close kind of relationships with students, even on the admissions side. So often I'll remember students I met on the road or I went to Holy Cross and I talk to these students when I see their application. I'm like, oh yes, I remember them. We had a really good conversation. So those are kind of pieces there. Um, and then for the optional pieces of an application, it really varies. You heard UW said, don't send us anything optional. We won't look at it. Please don't. Um, for Oberlin, you know, like you can send all the optional things you want. <laughs> We're happy to have them. Again, it comes down to the volume of actual applications we get and how much time we can actually spend reviewing them. So if you're trying to put in an art portfolio or something artistic, all schools, again, have different ways to do it. Um, for Oberlin, you'd apply to us, you'd indicate you want to do an art supplement. And then once you've applied, you kind of get a link a couple of days later saying, thanks for applying. Here's your, your application portal, sign in. When you sign in, then you can actually upload any kind of data, any kind of media that you want to be part of your application to be reviewed. Um, different schools do it differently. So there are some schools, if you're interested in theater, you need to put in that supplement and then somebody will review it. And it's like kind of evaluative. Ours is really put as kind of an additional, not extracurricular, but it just kind of adds as evidence to your application. You can kind of see some of the products of some of the things you've talked about before. Um, and then for folks that are interested in music, we do have some conservatory folks kind of look at it and then say like, this would be a level to do private lessons. This is a level where they could do lessons with a conservatory student X, Y, and Z. So that's how it works at Oberlin. Um, but for supplementals, you really do have to look at the schools. Typically your larger schools are not gonna be wanting all these extra pieces of paper. Um, but for us, we're, we're happy to take those too. So I know that uh, we are kind of short for time. So I'm gonna end there. I don't know if there's any other questions in the chat that I could have answered, but just let me know. Thank you, Anna and Ben and Siobhan. If you, if uh, perhaps we'll all turn our cameras on uh, for our final, final minutes together here. Um, we do have a couple of questions that are that are out here, and maybe we can address one of the questions to all of you. There's a question that I think is a great question. So specifically for the University of Washington, our local flagship public university, but colleges out there, do you differentiate during the application review process for a student that attended Holy Names Academy versus a Seattle public high school? And you can broaden that to just maybe talking about how you how you read applications from school to school. Whoever would like to tackle that. Thank you. Yeah, I can I can start real quick here. Um I, I think in short when we're reading up 
applications at the University of Washington. Um, we have some contextual in information about just about every high school out there, and especially like the local schools where you can have a consistent flow of students from those schools each year. We have some of that contextual information that allows us to understand, I'd say, like the curriculum, rigor of curriculum, and how well, um, say, a Holy Names education sets a student up for at the University of Washington. So we're not looking at like reputation. We're not comparing, say, like Seattle Public Schools versus Holy Names, but we just do look at that contextual information for every school. I can also concur the same thing, <laughs> for sure. I've often heard admissions representatives in both Angelica and I have worn, worn your hats before on the college side that it's you're often looking at students within the context of their high school. What is it that your particular high school offers curriculum-wise, extracurriculars, et cetera, and looking at, at that, that student within the context of their school? And I see all the head nodding, so we're... We're still remembering correctly, Angelica, this is good. Um, I think perhaps, I'm not sure there's still been a, you know, a comment about expanding <laughs> the computer science program. It's probably a loaded question that you may not have all the answers to, but it's a great question from a, a parent about you know, just computer science in general. And this is a, a specific topic, Anna and Siobhan, to uh, University of Washington and computer science. Ben, if you wanna try to tackle it a little bit, we love to yeah. hear what, what you have what you know <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll hop in i say as an admissions counselor at UW, i know a little bit about a lot of different things um but in short i think computer science has like doubled if not tripled their capacity in the last like you know 10 to 15 years or so i was looking for some links and then just these long bulky um PDFs of all the like bureaucracy behind UW and how the interplay between state legislature and funding. But um, in short, we're always thinking about growing. We just opened the new like um, Bill, and, Bill and Melinda Gates Center for Computer Science. We get a lot of funding from local tech companies, but um, kind of as you said there in the question, um, there's just far more demand that's um, out, outpacing our space here at the UW. I'll try to drop a link in that Q&A, but our, the Allen School, they host um, information sessions about freshman direct admission and could probably speak to that more in detail too. You could also come to a liberal arts college and study computer science. Yay. <laughs> a little plug. Excellent. Yes. I think um, it's it's fascinating. Over the years that, that I've been now on the high school side, um, this is my 16th year at Holy Names. This is uh, Angelica's third year at Holy Names. Um, we hear often as colleges are, you know, we're talking about new majors or expanded majors. The addition of not just computer science, because those are long standing programs, but the, the, the variations of computer science, bioinformatics, data science, that seems to be that the universities and colleges out there, small liberal arts colleges, large public universities are trying to meet that demand in creative ways. And for, for students who might not want to do coding, but might want to just use tech in a, in a different way as, as careers are changing, really. Um, so, Ben, thank you very much for answering that specifically. Um, I was going to just make a few comments. We've talked a little bit about financial aid tonight. And one more plug for our webinar, Financial Aid Night, that's coming up on Wednesday, September the 27th. Again, we have a director of financial aid who will be speaking. And there are some, some big changes with the federal form, the FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid. You've heard some of our speakers talk about it. This will delay seniors when you will be able to fully apply for financial aid because the, the process typically opens October 1st. So we've talked about two forms tonight, the CSS profile, which is a college board form. Holy Cross and Oberlin, you both use profile as you're nodding, excellent. Okay, so what I've heard from some schools is that if it's a profile school, they're gonna use that profile information to maybe make an initial package, but we'll still need the federal FAFSA form to firm up those offers, which may delay when packages are being sent out and when decision deposits are gonna be required. And you've all touched on that a little bit. I think that's gonna be different at every college, especially as we move through the fall and wait for what the federal government is able to um, do with the updated FAFSA. So more to come on that. And then there will be the Seattle National College Fair that will be at the Washington State Convention Center we are promoting to our students and families to look at going on Saturday, October the 7th, as opposed to Friday, October the 6th, as that is a school day for Holy Names, but that will run from noon to four. There's information in the parent, uh, the college counselor's corner in our parent newsletter. We're going to pr be promoting it to students moving forward. 
typically about 300 colleges and universities from all over the world will be at that fair. So it can be, it can feel a little overwhelming. Our pro tip is do not go right when they open. Do not go at noon. Maybe go at two o'clock when things slow down a little bit and the admissions reps are able to really talk to students and families. But that's a great um, public facing free opportunity for, for families of all grade levels to, to engage with admissions folks. And then I answered a question in my comments about athletics. I don't know if any of you work with athletics at your institutions. When does that process happen typically? My comment was it depends on the sport, it depends on the division of competition and the institution as to when verbal commits might happen, national letters of intent might be signed. And here at Holy Names, we have a range of athletes who do often go on to compete at various levels for various sports, some with scholarships, some without. Do any of you have comments about athletic recruiting? And if not, that's okay, but maybe a couple of comments as we're winding down. Um, I do work on the athletic recruitment side. Um, we're D3 at Oberlin, though, so we don't have to do all of the fancy things. Um, but typically, students are kind of getting contacted in, like, that summer of junior year type of thing, um, and then coaches will really get on it. Um, a lot of the folks will be looking for like some some places will do something called a pre-read. Um, so they'll ask for a transcript and they'll also ask for your school profile and they'll kind of send that to admissions. Um, and then admissions looks at it and says, this person looks like an admissible student. You can continue to recruit them. Um, and again, that kind of varies between institutions, how they do that. Um, but there is an official process where the coaches are directly in contact with admissions. It's not they're saying like you have to take this student or anything and again i'm not familiar with how it works on like the d1 d2 level um but it is kind of a relationship that we have um and schools see athletes as you know very valuable because we know what they're going to do when they come to campus already there's somebody who's committed in that way and they have kind of a team to support them in that space too um but usually that's how it goes um if you're someone who wants to get recruited by a place you know start filling out those questionnaires like reach out to coaches do those types of things Coaches, you know, they have a lot of different recruitment systems that they'll use to find students. But sometimes if you don't have that profile on Be Recruited or X, Y, and Z, you might just be getting passed by, not because of talent, but just because they couldn't see you. So definitely start reaching out, doing those types of things. Um, and then if you are a D1, D2 kind of level, the coaches will let you know exactly what's going on. But again, if you're just sitting there waiting for coaches to reach out to you, it just might not be the reality. They just might not be able to find you. It doesn't mean that you're not talented enough to do it. So, yeah. Great perspective, Anna. So we're at two minutes to seven. It looks like our, I think our comments have been uh, address. I don't know if there's anything else we want to, to add based on the questions that were asked tonight, panelists, family members. If you have any final question to pop into the Q&A, please do. Okay, I think we're, I think we're there. Uh, families and students who are out there uh, on Zoom, thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. And again, if you joined us late, I said at the beginning that this we see it's recording. We hope it is in fact recording and it will be uh, posted and in, uh, in the parent portal. So behind that parent login, we hope by uh, the end of the week. So please feel free to, to watch again uh, or share with any of your friends who were not able to attend. But we truly do thank our uh, wonderful speakers tonight for joining us from not even University of Washington. He's out in Spokane. Anna is in Chicago and Siobhan is in Tennessee. So we are so appreciative of you spending time with us and sharing your expertise and your answers um, with our community. So thank you so, so much. Angelica, anything final? Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all very much. And uh, seniors, parents, family members of seniors, we look forward to working with you uh, closely through the fall. And for everyone else out there, we look forward to working with you uh, throughout your time at Holy Names. Thanks again, everyone. Bye-bye.